good afternoon and welcome. We are glad that you all are joining us today. I'm Becca Bonnell, the Director of, Col Director of Client Development here in the College of Veterinary Medicine, and we're so excited to be celebrating this event of the new Whirling Comparative Oncology Research Center. Um, so I would like to now introduce Dr. Knapp, uh, the Center Director, to introduce the team members that are here with us today. Thanks, Becca, and thank you all for joining us in this, this really special day. Um, what we're doing today is we are opening the Whirling Comparative Oncology Research Center. Uh, we're very excited about this. And what we're going to do is, is let you all meet some of our team members. And then we're going to talk about um, where we've been, where we're going, and save some time for questions and answers. And I'm going to start off by introducing the doctors in our program. Um, for any of you that haven't met me, I'd like to meet you in the future, but I'm Debbie Knapp. I'm on faculty here. I'm a veterinary medical oncologist. And for each person, I'm going to try to say one little tidbit about them. And for myself, I'll say that I arrived here in 1985 for three years, and I'm still working on that three-year stint. So uh, I'm really <laughs> glad to be here. <laughs> um, next to me is Dr. Mike Childress, another one of the, the Hello. Med veterinary medical oncologists. And uh, I had to write this down, Mike, because I was afraid I would forget. But when Mike isn't busy being an oncologist, um, he and his wife and three children also take care of three dogs, four cats, 24 chickens, <laughs> nine fish, a leopard gecko, and an axolot. Um, so you can tell his family loves animals. Um, and then next to him is Dr. Chris Fulkerson, Hi. who's uh, another one of the uh, oncologists here. And Chris, Chris is his, uh, one of his distinctions is he has filled every position in our oncology program over the years, including undergraduate volunteer, paid assistant, veterinary student, veterinary resident, and now is on the faculty. And the only position he hasn't filled is that of uh, being one of the veterinary nurses. And we'll get to them in a minute. And then, Another um, doctor I want to introduce, but maybe not in the sense of what you all think, is Dr. Dupika Dawn, and Dupika can wave. One of the things that makes our program special is that we have people like Dupika working with us. She is a basic scientist, mm -hmm. and she's really a guru in, uh, in, in molecular biology, bioinformatics, chemistry, she really is, is, is someone that's probably cloned herself multiple times. And it, it really helps us to have people like that, that not only do we know what works and what doesn't work, but we know why and how to make it better. Um, and then we have four other veterinarians I'd like to introduce you to, and they are our residents. For any of you that don't know this, um, our residents are spending three years with us. They're already DVMs and they're learning to be cancer specialists and they really are workhorses in the clinic. Um, and I'll just introduce them. Ellen Kerbitz is our, our fourth year resident, and she came to us from Ohio State, uh, did her DVM at Ohio State. Connor Williams is a second year resident that earned his DVM from K-State or Kansas State. Rebecca Weiske earned her DVM at Virginia Tech. And then Olivia Giels just joined us recently, and she earned her DVM at Louisiana State. Um, so that's the doctors on our team, and now I'm going to ask Lindsay Forez if she would introduce our nursing staff and a couple other staff members. Lindsay, take it away. Yeah, um, so we have six veterinary nurses on our staff at this point. Um, Sarah Larman, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, she is our supervisor, um, and she uh, is from Arumville, Indiana, and her loves are coffee, plants, reading, shopping, and her family, of course. Um, then I'm Lindsay. Um, I am from Oakwood, Illinois, and I just earned my BTS in 2022, which is um, a technician specialty in oncology, and my loves are dachshunds. <laughs> um, then we have Lindley Brewer, who she is from Petersburg, Indiana, and her loves are reading the outdoors and spending time with her family. Then we have Miss Jerry um, Tullius, who is from Terre Haute, Indiana. Her, her, she enjoys going camping and spending time um, with her family. 
And then Arena Holland is um, from Indianapolis, Indiana, and she enjoys attending Renaissance fairs um, in the summertime. And then we have Erica Fessler, who is from Kokomo, Indiana, and her loves are to travel and she likes to eat food. <laughs> um, we also have a, a veterinary assistant who we can get through out our day without, um, Cheryl Douglas. She is from Fowler, Indiana, and um, fun fact about her is that she is in the veterinary nursing distance learning program, um, and she started that back in 2019, so she is slowly um, getting her nursing degree while she works with us. Um, and then we have our lab technician, um, Alex Enstrom. He's from Jasonville, Indiana, and he likes British game shows and ice cold brewed coffee. <laughs> and then we also have two um, client liaisons that they're not here with us. I think they're joining via Zoom, um, but we have Joni um, Kraus and she enjoys using her woodworking skills um, to design and create ukuleles. And then we have um, Emma Wood, who enjoys judging horses, and she likes to work with instructing the FFA members on how to do so. And then, um, just a little note, this is actually a note that Sarah wrote um, that she wanted me to share with everybody, but she's incredibly blessed to work with such a compassionate group um, that every day shows up with a big heart and a purpose to make a difference in the lives of both pets and people. She's very humbled by the talent, skills, and dedication to the success of our research efforts. And within our nursing staff alone, we have over 50 years of combined service to medical oncology combined. Um, many of us have lost loved ones and pets to cancer, and these losses have only made us more passionate about what we do in medical oncology. Um, and then at this time, I'd like to introduce Lindley, who's going to share a little bit about why she's here with us. Yes. Um, hey, uh, so I'm Lindley. I know Lindsay just introduced me, but I'm one of the medical oncology veterinary nurses. Um, I just wanted to briefly share um, why being a part of the Whirling Comparative Oncology Research Center is so meaningful to me. Um, besides the love I have for caring for animals, the comparative part of our mission is also important to me for a different reason. Um, and that's how we translate our research efforts to benefit humans as well, um, not just animals. So it's super important to us too. Um, my sister, she was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 22. Um, unfortunately, she passed away two years later. She underwent multiple surgeries, treatments, you name it, she had it. Um, she continued her college courses though, throughout everything. Um, she never once let the cancer affect her goals in life. She graduated from ISU with a nursing degree. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away eight months later, so she wasn't able to, um, be a nurse anywhere, but the Riley's Children's Hospital had been saving her a nursing position in the pediatric oncology department. Um, she just wasn't ever able to fulfill her dream, unfortunately. Um, but to me, I was only 12 at the time um, of her diagnosis and her battle with cancer definitely left its mark on me. I won't ever forget what she went through how it permanently affected everyone in our family. Um, there are things I took away from that difficult time that inspired me to help those in the same situation. I have a desire to make things better for my patients who are also diagnosed with cancer. I offer support and guidance to family members as they go through this process with their pet. I've been there until the very end with some of these patients and their family, and I often cry myself when it's time to say goodbye to them. So my sister and her, her battle with cancer inspired me to take this leap into medical oncology. I was really fortunate that they had an open position that never, that never happens here. Um, so I took a leap of faith and I um, applied for it and thankfully I got it. And I'll always be grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this group and something that helps change lives for the better. Um, Without a doubt, I know my sister would be happy to see our team's progress uh, and just see how many lives we've positively, positively impacted with our work. Um, but I know I can say many of us sitting around this table have had a similar life experience that involves a loved one, human or pet, um, being diagnosed with cancer. 
I can assure you that we all take this mission personally. I'm thankful to be surrounded by this group of people that share the same passion and dedication. We absolutely love our patients and we only want what is best for them. I love that we're able to try new things. We're always in search of a bigger and better treatment for all of these cancers. I'm thankful that most of our clinical research trials are funded so we can perform critical diagnostics and treatments as well as making it financially affordable for our clients to get the care they need. Um, and I truly believe that our center will never stop trying to do and learn more for humans and animals alike. Thank you, Lindley. Yeah, appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, for sure. So I, I think you can appreciate we have an awesome team and we're not, this is not just our jobs. This is, this is what we do. And this is how we want to make the world a better place. So Becca, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those tidbits as well about the team. That's really impactful to, to learn a little bit more about you all, but Dr. Knapp, can you tell us a little bit about how the program started and how it has reached the point that it is at today? Uh, sure. I think this is, going to go back just a few years. Um, so back in 1979, there were three true pioneers here at Purdue. Um, Gordon Kopik uh, was a pharmacologist. Ralph Richardson, who was my mentor, was a veterinary oncologist, and Bill Carlton was a pathologist, and they formed the Purdue Comparative Oncology Program. And I was fortunate to join the program in 1985. And as I've told you, that was for three years and I'm, I'm still here, but the mission has always remained the same. And that is we can learn things from pet dogs with naturally occurring cancer that will help other dogs and will help people. And I think we've, we've been really fortunate. We've, we've had a lot of success, um, but I also feel like we are on the verge of just going to an entirely new level. And why is that? I think beyond the commitment of this group, there, there are two big reasons for that. Um, science is advancing at a level way beyond anything I would see, anything I thought I'd see in my lifetime. I mean, the, the opportunities are, are just incredible, um, but also, the rest of the world is beginning to understand how important comparative oncology is, and that is why it's important to, to get behind it. Um, one example is earlier in my career, when we would send grants to the National Cancer Institute, um, they would come back and the reviewers would say, oh, do dogs get cancer? Or you don't need dogs, you've got mice, and you know, go, go ask some veterinary pharmaceutical company for money instead. Whereas in the last few years, the National Cancer Institute has invested over $30 million in research to be done in dogs to benefit people as well as dogs. And, and we've been fortunate, I think we've received over 3 million of that. So it's, it's just, it's incredible. And one of the reasons we're here today is that I'll preface this by saying our group's been really fortunate. We have received grants from the government, from pharma, from industry, other industries, from foundations, but really what has allowed us to do some of our very most important work is the generous financial support from individuals and families. It's, it's people that have been touched by what we do um, maybe they've come here or maybe they haven't. Maybe they've just been grateful for the discoveries we've made. But anyway, a lot of them, our most important work happens because of generous donation. And there have been hundreds of people over the years that have contributed to our program. But today, I really want to point out one uh, very special lady in particular, um, Sue Ann Whirling. And I'll go back and, and explain um, how this all started. I even have a prop here. I don't know if you all can see this, uh, but this is Brandy, uh, Brandy uh, Whirling. Um, she started coming here in 2005. And, and we were joking about this earlier because some places in her medical record, she's listed as an Australian shepherd. 
Um, she's also been called a golden retriever, although I don't know why. Um, but anyway, she just was one of those incredible dogs that, that touched our hearts. And she had bladder cancer. She participated in two different clinical trials and did well for over a year, um, but unfortunately ended up succumbing to the disease when it had spread to her bones. But along the way, we got to know Sue Ann and her husband, Evan, and they brought other dogs here and they, they appreciated what we did and they started making donations to the program. And, and then recently they've made a, a particularly particularly generous, generous donation that's allowed us to establish this Whirling Comparative Oncology Research Center. And Sue Ann's joining us on Zoom, and I was just going to ask if she wouldn't mind if she'd just say a few words about, about her journey and, and, and what this means. And before she comes on, I, 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 I will say that we were all sad. Evan did pass away from pancreatic cancer in April. I'm convinced he's looking down on us, but but we do have Sue Ann with us today. So Sue Ann, would you mind saying just just a few words and and why you why you and Evan you know feel so strongly about this? Well, I would love to. Um, I um, I hope I don't get emotional, so I will try to keep it together here. Uh, Evan and I live a very modest lifestyle. Our careers have been built around strong relationships and results. As small business owners, he and I had no doubt that an investment in Purdue was an investment in advancing the treatments and cures for cancer. As Dr. Knapp has mentioned, the cancers seen in dogs closely mimic cancers in people. And I believe that Purdue is poised to be the leaders in cancer research. I had the honor the other day to meet this team around this table. And one word stuck out to me, and that was the word unicorn. I don't know if you all remember that conversation, but someone brought up the word unicorn. I was so impressed by the group that day that I ran home and I looked up the professional definition of a unicorn. They're actually very, very difficult to find, but LinkedIn defines a unicorn as shattering expectations, raising the bar for everyone, and are simply a joy to be around. Unicorn teams literally take their business to the next level or levels. I saw that in every single person around that table. You all are the hope. You're the hope for that scary word that no one ever wants to hear. And I heard it regarding Brandy and my husband, Evan. Again, it's about relationships and results. And Evan and I truly, truly believe that in life. Evan is with us in spirit, and Dr. Knapp, I know he's looking down, and I have no doubt that he's smiling. Thank you all for your passion. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sue Ann. Uh, I mean, what you all are, are doing is, is, is absolutely incredible, and, and I appreciate you being brave and coming on the, the call today and sharing some of your thoughts. Um, I mean, it's... It, it, Receiving financial support, obviously, we're extremely appreciative, but it's it's as much, as you said, the relationships, but it, it's the value that others place in, in what we're doing. So we really appreciate that. So, Becca, I think I'll turn it back to you yes, again. Yes. Um, if we could now at this time take a, a little bit of a dive into where the program is going and, and what the center is all about now with this generous donation and what that looks like. Sure. Well, I'll start and then I'm going to ask others to chime in as well. I think if we look at, first, let's, let's look at, I, I think we should look at probably three phases that we're going through. Um, the first phase is to, to build on what we have within the cancer types that we've been focusing on, such as bladder cancer, lymphoma, and, 
and, and there are other areas. I, I think we can take that to a level we never have and really get into the mechanistic reasons for why it happens in the first place. Why does it progress? You know, how do we prevent it? How do we stop it? Um, but building on that, we'll definitely be expanding our focus. Um, we'll be looking at other cancer types. One in particular that we've actually already started delving into, but one I want to mention is osteosarcoma, which is primary bone cancer. Um, this is the cancer that Tyler Trent had. If any of you didn't follow the story, Tyler Trent was this amazing Purdue student that um, came to Purdue and went through his journey with osteosarcoma, uh, started before Purdue, but then he continued it here as a student. And he just became, he was an incredible young man that everybody rallied around and rallied behind. And I still remember him being at the Ohio State football game when we beat Ohio State in football, when no one on the planet predicted that, except Tyler. And uh, you know some of his some of his his friends and family, but anyway, his family has created an endowment at Purdue to develop a research program in osteosarcoma. It's being um, uh, organized by our National Cancer Institute designated cancer center. But they're asking us in the veterinary school to be some of the key leaders in that, and it makes sense because it's hard to. It's hard to reproduce human osteosarcoma in experimental models, but dogs, unfortunately for the dogs, get it. And interestingly, dogs develop this cancer 20 times more often than people do. So there, there's no shortage of dogs to help us learn about this disease, but there'll, there'll be others as well. Um, but ultimately, I'm gonna be brave and share with you all our, our big vision, and that is to get to the point that we have a St. Jude hospital for dogs, a place where people can bring their animals, where there'll be trials, where there'll be incredible expertise, um, where there will hopefully be financial support. And you know, that, that's our vision. And, and I think we'll get there. It won't be tomorrow. It's going to take a while, but I think we'll get there. Um, but for today, you know, let, let's step back into, into the, you know, the current realm that we're in. And, and I actually was going to ask Mike Childress and Chris Falkerson, if they might comment on the research they're doing, um, you know, where it is, where it's going, and then I can tell you a little bit more about bladder cancer, but Mike, do you want to start with this? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So my research for the past several years has focused primarily on lymphoma in dogs. Uh, this is one of the leading causes of cancer-related death in dogs, so it's an extremely common type of cancer. Um, really what our group here has been focused on has been on a couple of things. One, identifying uh, new prognostic biomarkers in this cancer, so trying to identify who are the dogs that are going to have more aggressive cancers that um, would perhaps benefit from newer therapies uh, more. And then two, really trying to target specific therapies at dogs most likely to benefit from them. Um, so that, that gets at this notion of precision medicine or personalized medicine, um, trying to define certain aspects of a, an individual dog's tumor, whether that be genetic mutations, um, or even more recently, we've been studying um, physical ways in which the cells interact and respond to chemotherapies um, using a, a, a machine that was developed by a physicist here on campus. Um, we're trying to develop ways of identifying, again, who are the dogs most likely to benefit from a given therapy so that we can target therapy specifically to dogs in a, a precision or personalized manner um, so that we end up seeing better outcomes for all dogs with lymphomas. Um, Dr. Fulkerson and I have been working together on osteosarcoma as well, and we've got a couple of exciting collaborations um, developing, um, one with the IU School of Medicine that I can let Chris probably describe, and then one that um, we're developing with um, folks in radiation oncology and radiobiology here on campus, where we are investigating the ability of radiation therapy to induce an immune response, so irradiating a dog's primary tumor, which usually occurs on a bone on the leg, and identifying whether or not an immune response can be elicited by treating that primary tumor that then goes on to treat cancer that has spread elsewhere in the body or done what's called metastasis. It's metastasis that is ultimately lethal in both dogs and people with osteosarcoma. Um, so if we can identify ways to elicit 
an immune response um, by treating the primary tumor with radiation, that may be a way of treating the metastasis as well. Um, so we've got a lot of exciting things coming up in lymphoma and osteosarcoma, and I'm, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to explore both of those. Chris? Yeah, I, I can uh, um, you know, pick up uh, on Mike's comments about osteosarcoma. That's an area that is pretty important to us to expand into because it's a, a really devastating cancer that, um, as Debbie mentioned, dogs are at a higher risk of getting than people um, and causes a lot of pain because the tumors form inside of the dog's legs. I mean, it can cause lameness and, and just all sorts of signs that are really distressing both for the, for the pet and the pet owner. So we're really looking for ways to kind of expand our efforts in that area. Um, and I think, you know, due to the work that's been done here, uh, um, some external collaborators from the IU Simon Cancer Center reached out to us about uh, trying to work together to develop some comparative projects looking at dog osteosarcoma um, to try to help develop better strategies to treat the disease in humans. Um, so we've been working with a, a great collaborator at IU um, named Ed Greenfield. Um, he's a, a faculty member down at the, the Simon Cancer Center. Um, and he's actually uh, working with us to collect samples from dogs with osteosarcoma. And then we're actually growing tiny tumors um, in a Petri dish um, and basically looking at how those tumors respond to different chemotherapy drugs um, to hopefully predict how that would actually work, uh, you know, inside of a, a dog or a person that has that sort of a, a tumor. And um, so far, it's had some, some pretty interesting results with the drugs that have been trialed so far. Um, and our long-term goal is to take uh, what's working in a Petri dish and these kind of um, 3D cell culture models, and then hopefully having a clinical trial in dogs where we can see if that can make a, make a difference. Uh, you know, the treatments that we use for cancers like osteosarcoma in dogs currently are the same treatments we've been using for decades, and we've kind of plateaued of what we can do with our, our current treatments, and I um, really need to expand into to new therapeutic avenues, and um, that's what we think his platform will hopefully allow us um, to develop. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, I would say I'm a little bit more of a generalist than Mike and Debbie, so I've not been as laser focused on one tumor type um, or even necessarily just on the actual treatment of cancer. So um, I had a nice conversation with Sue Ann when she visited about my interest in, in kind of uh, the impact that caring for you know, a loved one with cancer has on you. Um, um, so I work with a neuropsychologist from Kent State University named Beth Spitznagel um, looking at this phenomenon called caregiver burden, um, which is the strain that we feel when we're taking care of a loved one. Um, and there's kind of a, a circuitous route back to produce. So Beth had a dog that had bladder cancer um, and had spent most of her career studying caregiver burden in people who were caring for loved ones with dementia. And she noticed, you know, going through that journey herself, that she was experiencing the same sorts of things that she was studying. Um, and so, you know, she sat out to see if that actually occurred in people with pets and um, uh, coming as no surprise to veterinarians, it certainly does. Um, and that's a reflection, you know, of the, the great bond we have with our pets. And um, so some of our work together is really geared at, at looking at ways we can minimize that stress and discomfort um, and try to help folks um, that are dealing with these difficult times, difficult diseases with their pets uh, um, to um, you know, really enjoy that and, and minimize um, you know, the stress associated with that. Um, and then we're also looking at ways to help the veterinary team um, because it is uh, you know, a stressful thing for um, veterinarians and veterinary nurses and other veterinary professionals to work with as well. So um, we're developing training programs um, to help uh, um, our students uh, become uh, you know, better at helping people uh, navigate these sorts of journeys. And um, those are some things that I'm pretty excited about out of the work that I've been doing. And one of the other things that I really appreciated you've done through the years is advocating for all of us to also be sure we take care of ourselves because our jobs obviously can get can get uh, you know get to to us at times. So I appreciate that. Um, on the bladder cancer front, I think I could categorize what we're doing into into four categories. Because um, if we step back and say, how are we really going to make the outcome better? whether it's people or whether it's dog, how, how are we gonna make the outcomes better? And I think there are three broad ways that we're going to do that. One is in prevention. The second is in better drugs or better combinations of drugs, or I should just say therapies, not just drugs. And then the third thing is how do we figure out how to treat each individual with what's going to help them the most rather than treating everybody essentially the same. And so on the prevention front, we have been studying ways to try to prevent even the earliest, the earliest growth that's going to turn into cancer. And then we've also been delving into early detection, early intervention. And 
The reason I'm excited about the prevention stuff is that stuff we can do today. We can be testing this today, or we, we actually been testing it before today. Whereas new drugs are going to take some time and individualizing, individualizing care is going to take some time. But with dogs, we have this tremendous advantage because of their breed associated risk. And that'll give us the advantage in deciphering the genes, the things that, that people and dogs are born with that increases their risk, but also the things they're exposed to. And if you think about it, how many of us remember what we ate last week? How many of us remember when we were last around mosquito spray? Or how many of us even noticed what chemicals we might've come in contact with? And if we look at our dogs, most of us know what our dogs ate last week. And we know when we applied like flea control products. And, and so it's a whole lot easier to track this stuff in dogs than it is in people. But from the dogs, we can discover things we ought, to, we ought to go look for in people. So in dogs, some of the risk factors are exposure to long chemicals, um, exposure to old types of flea control products. Like, I don't even think those have a place anymore. The old dips and powders and sprays that I applied when I was in high school working for a vet clinic. Um, those, you know, those products increase risk by like 28 fold for bladder cancer. Um, there are other ones, there's aniline dyes, like the kind of things you, you find in, in wood stains that you might be applying in your house. Um, there's exposure to cigarette smoke, which has been a more recent, a more recent thing. And, and so we can, we can find these things in dogs and then go look in people. Like one of the things we found in dogs, it's, we found it in a second study now. And so this means, yeah, we got to go study this, but dogs that live within a mile of a marsh have like a six or nine times higher risk of bladder cancer. And why is that? There, there are probably a couple of possible explanations. One is that marshes are filtration systems that trap pollutants. We use them for that. Um, and if the dog goes romping in the marsh, they're gonna be exposed to that. But also when people live near a marsh, they're a whole lot more likely to have their, their property sprayed for mosquitoes. And so now that we've picked this up in dogs, we need to go look in people. That, that's on the list of to do, things to do. But this breed associated risk also helps us do early prevention, early detection, early intervention studies. And we can do a study in two to three years in dogs that would take to study that equivalent time period in the life of a human would take 15 to 20 years. Um, in fact, we've just done this in Scottish Terriers. And we know that we can find it early. We know if we find it early, it makes a difference. In fact, in this study of 120 Scotties, we have so far found early cancer in 38 dogs when they had no outward evidence there was anything wrong with them. So I'm, I'm really intrigued with the prevention arm of things. Um, for new drugs, we're really fortunate to work with our National Cancer Institute designated cancer center. For any of you that don't know that, there's a center of over 100 faculty on campus devoted to cancer research. And it's human cancer research, but we're incredibly well integrated into that because they, they see the value of what we do to, to really impact what, what, what's done by others. Um, but within our group, we've taken the lead on developing a new canine immunotherapy. It's in a class of drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And, and so we're, you know, we're forging ahead with that. Um, so that's the kinds of things we're doing in bladder cancer. We're, we're actually also getting involved in artificial intelligence. And don't worry, we're not creating something that's going to go, you know, cause some horrible catastrophe in the earth. What, what we're doing is we're using it to analyze huge amounts of data that the human brain just can't wrap it. We can't wrap our brains around it. And it, it, it's answering questions like when people have bladder cancer and they have their bladder removed, I do half of those people enjoy cure and half of those people don't. How do we figure out who's in that group and how to, how to make it good for everybody? Or, or if we look at Jimmy Carter, who's been in the news lately, Jimmy is the poster child for kind of immunotherapy called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And when Jimmy was 90, he had metastatic melanoma in his brain and his liver. And he received a new immunotherapy and has 
knock on wood, been cancer free since then. But only about 20% of people that get that those drugs have the benefit that Jimmy Carter's had. And so now if you try to delve into immunotherapy, all of a sudden you have 50 different parameters you've got to analyze to figure out why does one person respond and the other doesn't. And within those 50 different categories, there are 100 different variables. And so this is where we need AI to help us sort this out. Um, but I think you can, I think you can see that, that I'm incredibly excited about where we're going, what we're doing. And, um, but I do want to leave time. I'm just looking at the clock here. I want to leave some time um, for questions and answers. So I think I'll turn it back over to Becca. And I think some people already submitted questions and yep. we, we can try to get through, get through those if we can. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much to all of those that did um, submit questions when they registered for this event. We really appreciate that. There were several that were overlapping or multiple, so we're going to combine some of those and ask the different doctors to give their input. Uh, so to get started, we'll start with a couple of more global ones. But one of the first questions is, what excites you most about current and future research opportunities afforded by um, the Whirling Comparative Oncology Research Center? I think I'm. I think I've been talking a lot. I, I think I'm going to ask. Uh, I think I'm going to ask Chris and then Mike to answer that, and then I'll I'll chime in with my thoughts as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that we're excited about is the opportunity to expand uh, um, the research that we're doing, especially into new and different tumor types, uh, um, and this idea that we can develop a program that can, you know, be a resource for lots of people and lots of pets with different sorts of diseases. Uh, um, and I think that's a really exciting prospect and something that might. Debbie and I have wanted to do for a long time. Uh, you know, we've all worked together for a long time, and I think this has been kind of one of our <laughs> goals. Um, and I think we're, you know, one step closer to, to making that happen. Um, we're really excited to hopefully be expanding our team as well. Um, and so that we think is going to make a big difference. So more people um, involved in doing the work uh, um, and building out those collaborations that we have, I think is, um, you know, a, a really important thing that these resources uh, will allow us to, to leverage both here with in the university and then looking for you know more partners outside the university so those are probably the things I'm, I'm most excited about i agree entirely with chris i'm really excited to just um, expand our research engine um, into other tumor types um, and uh, develop uh, more deeply in the tumor types we're already focusing in um, you know as, as a veterinary oncologist uh, for now it's been 15 years and it's been a lot i've been doing this a long time uh, and, you know, I've, I've seen what we can do with existing therapies, um, and we're doing a lot better with existing therapies than we used to. Uh, when I was, you know, a resident working, working with Debbie, uh, <laughs> Chris and I were both residents under Debbie, and Chris under Debbie and me, is sort of, we sort of got this little family situation going here. Uh, but, you know, I, I've, I've seen what the existing therapies do, and we're doing a lot better uh, now than we were, you know, a few years ago, and doing better certainly better than we were a long time ago, we still have a lot of progress. You know, there are still some cancer types for which existing therapies really don't help all that much. Um, and there are certain patients within existing cancers that so we know how to treat pretty well. There are certain patients that don't respond to those therapies very well. Um, and that's frustrating. You know, it, it's frustrating as a veterinarian to see those patients, those patients that don't really have a good option or where, um, you know, they've run up against the limitations of what current veterinary medicine can deliver. And so, Building up our research enterprise is going to allow us to meet the needs of those patients. You know, we may have a clinical trial with a new drug uh, in a couple of years that, you know, maybe that patient with incurable lymphoma or incurable bladder cancer or incurable bone cancer or, you know, incurable colon cancer, you know, whatever, uh, a, a few years ago, you know, maybe that's a patient that'll benefit tremendously um, from, from one of these new therapies. And, and, and that's what really excites me, uh, is, is the prospect to be helping more patients um, live longer um, than, than we could in the past. And then ultimately seeing those successes um, translated into, um, into the treatment of, of human cancer patients. Um, we're gonna be doing so much good stuff in the next few years. I, I really can't wait to see it happen. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I, I, I to follow up on, on what they said. First, you can tell that we really are a family and, and once people join our group, they generally stay, so, which is great. Uh, I think what I'm most excited about is the impact. I think it's going to be 
um, deeper, broader. Um, I, I just, as I said, I think we're getting ready to just explode with good things. And, and I, I'm one of these people that's been in this field, as I said, since 85 and, and I still like getting up and coming to work. And I, people laugh at me, but I say, there are days I literally have to pinch myself that we are having the opportunities that we are and that I think the potential is, is better than it's ever been. So that's what makes me excited. Awesome, awesome to hear. Another great question we received is, what is the most important question to answer in pet animal oncology today in order to find the next big breakthrough? Chris, do you want to start again? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that's maybe frustrating to me as a, a veterinarian is that we actually don't still know a lot about a lot of things. Uh, I mean, there are fewer roadblocks in place uh, I'm in the veterinary market to stop something from coming to the market. Um, so there may be things that are already out there that are being marketed as treatments or cures that we don't know a lot about. Uh, um, and so to me, it's not necessarily one question that's the most important question to ask, but it's important to ask the question. And I think that's the thing that our group is very uh, passionate about. Uh, um, that's, you know, asking a question, investigating that question and trying to get good results that allow us to make you know, better decisions for our patients. Um, so I really would like to see uh, that level of scientific rigor uh, um, kind of throughout veterinary oncology as a whole. Um, and that to me is really like the big thing. It's not maybe one question in general, but it's how we even approach those questions. You know, um, you know, things, you know, before they're out there and marketed and being used on pets, I think we really have to make sure they work uh, um, and if they do what we think they're going to do. Um, and that unfortunately has not always been the case uh, um, um, in veterinary oncology and other areas of veterinary medicine, just because there are fewer kind of obstacles in there. So, um, you know, again, I hope that as people see the sorts of work that we're doing and the sorts of impact that it can have, it really encourages people to be rigorous about that process because it is so important, you know, the outcomes for the animals. And then as we mentioned already, you know, trying to apply things that we can learn, especially on short timescales on animals to humans. We really need to make sure that information is as accurate and applicable as we can. So, um, so maybe for me, it's not one question, it's that bigger global question of approach that's the, the most important thing we have to really work on as a community. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Chris, Mike. Yeah. Um, for me, there's a ton, a ton of uh, important unanswered questions out there. One that I think would um, be really important to answer for pet owners is why did this happen? Why did this happen to my pet? Um, you know, what, what caused my pet's cancer? Um, Debbie alluded to some of the work that she and, and colleagues here at Purdue have done to define environmental risk factors for dogs with bladder cancer. So things that they can be in contact with out in their environment that increase um, or sometimes decrease their, their risk for bladder cancer. And um, it's great that we have that information for dogs with bladder cancer. For most cancers, that information doesn't exist. We, we don't know anything about it. Um, and, and it's because the um, the, the type of work it takes to really do those studies has never been, never been undertaken in, in an organized fashion. Um, and I, I think that having a center that's dedicated to um, what's called the epidemiology, the, the study of the, the frequency of disease within populations and how, how that modifies um, in accordance with, with certain risk factors. And having a study here eventually devoted to canine cancer epidemiology, I, I think would be fantastic, where we could take data from all over the state of Indiana, look at dogs with a variety of cancer types, look at what's in their environment, what they've been exposed to, correlate that with breed specific risk, because we know that breed is a very powerful risk factor for many cancer types in dogs, and really start to home in on what are some things that people could be doing in their lives, in their environments to modify their dog's risk for cancer, hopefully decrease their dog's risk for cancer, help them age in a, in a healthy fashion um, in, in a way that, that decreases their risk for um, some of these really, really terrible diseases. So, I mean, that's, if I had to pick one question I'd really try to answer, it would be re related to that, to, to canine cancer epidemiology and can we find what causes cancer in, in dogs um, uh, with greater precision? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cop out as well because I have many questions, <laughs> but I'll, I'll zero in on one. I want us to 
better understand how to use the immune system to fight cancer. And it, I actually, when I started in the veterinary oncology field, I was in tumor, I was, I was doing research in tumor immunology. When I say I, it's, I, I hate to use the word I because it was we, um, I was fortunate to work with others, but we were, we were trying to understand how to harness the immune system. And then we got away from that for years because the tools weren't there. Um, if you think about studying the immune system in mice and in people, you, and you need a certain antibody, you, you just go online and you buy it and you've got it in your lab the next day. And, and for dogs, those things don't exist. You'd be amazed in a bad way at the tools we don't have, but now we're getting them. Um, in fact, Dr. Dewan is, is going abroad in, in a few weeks to bring back to Purdue a particular tool to allow us to make antibodies. It's, it's, she's learning to use a phage display library. So then we won't be held back by the lack of tools. We will, we will be able to generate the tools. But I am convinced more so than ever, the immune system has everything to do with everything that we do. And it's not just, yeah, the new immunotherapies are great. We're excited about the drug we're developing. We're excited about you know, what's moving forward on the human side. But even the drugs that we've been using for 30 years, some of their major effects are through the immune system. They're not just what we thought they were. And so at the time an individual is diagnosed, we need to define what I'm going to call their immune state. How effective is their immune system working? Is it seeing things in the tumor that it thinks are foreign and it should eliminate? Does it have the right balance of what we call um, pro-immune cells that will attack the cancer versus those that keep the immune system in check? And what I see us doing is defining the immune state and then knowing one or probably a cocktail of drugs to take advantage of that. So I think that's, it, that's one of the major things that we need to solve is how do we get the immune system on our side. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that it is extremely important. And, and that's one of the things I'm most excited about. So, and and I, I could give you another 50 questions, but I, but I won't. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there were several questions we received about how to prevent and screen for TCC. Dr. Knapp, could you provide us any insight on this topic? Um, sure. Um, and actually, th that's a very timely question. So TCC, many of you probably know, stands for transitional cell carcinoma. Um, it has another name, invasive urothelial carcinoma, and it's bladder cancer in dogs. It's, it's, you know, those two names represent the same cancer. So I think pet owners can do two things right now. One is to take steps that we've identified that they can use to prevent the cancer. So what are those? Avoid lawn chemicals, avoid smoke, avoid um, old generation flea control products, avoid obesity, um, avoid aniline dyes, um, try to stay away from air and water pollution to the extent you can. Um, we, we haven't yet figured out, there's, there's, there's something about age of spay neuter and we haven't sorted that out, but I think stay tuned because we may come back and suggest not doing those things real early because it will increase risk of bladder cancer and bone cancer. So things the pet owner can do are try to avoid those things to the extent you can and, and don't lay awake at night worrying that you can't avoid all of them because you can't. I mean, those things are everywhere in our environment, but just do the best you can. Feed vegetables, especially in dogs and high risk breeds. Um, if we look at the human literature, the veggies that are probably the best are what we call cruciferous vegetables. So that's broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. But in the study that we did, the veggie fed most often was carrots. So um, I, 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 think the I think vegetables as a class are important to feed. Don't, don't overdo it. Like if you have a Scotty and all of a sudden you give it 10 baby carrots, it's probably gonna get a stomach ache and diarrhea. Um, so, you know, introduce these things sort of gradually. Um, so people have also asked me about diet. 
really any name brand dog food or balanced homemade diet is fine. Um, do try to get the veggies in there. Um, you know, those, those are things you can do. So the second broad thing that we're really beginning to appreciate that is important is screening. So for dogs in high risk breeds, Scotties, Westies, Beagles, wire hair, Fox Terriers, Shelties, there, there are probably others I'm forgetting. We, we did the study in Scotties. We started at age six and every three months we did um, an ultrasound of the urinary tract and we did a urinalysis with urine sediment exam. And that was our screening. And that enabled us to find it early. And when we found it early, we intervened in this initial study with a very conservative treatment. It was single agent non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. We use one called Deramax. And with that, if you look at the remission rate and how long remissions lasted, it was twice as long in those dogs as in dogs where we didn't find the cancer until it was more advanced. So I, you know, I officially don't have any data on Shelties and Beagles, but if I owned a Sheltie, a Beagle, a Westie, I would start screening it. Um, we did learn something sort of surprising in that study and that interestingly, the BRAF test didn't turn out to be all that useful. In fact, we saw a lot of false positives. So we, you know, at this point we'd advocate for ultrasound, the urinary tract and urinalysis with the urine sediment exam. Um, those are the things that, so any of the rest of you that have heard me say this a hundred times, am I forgetting anything? <laughs> But I, I do, I, I'm convinced prevention's really important. So that's, that's my two cents worth. Great. Um, moving on, we had a few questions about supplements, including CBD oil. Dr. Fulgerson, I know you have been involved in studies um, of CBD oil on dogs. Could you enlighten us on this topic? Yeah, so, you know, CBD oil is something that uh, gets a lot of traction and a lot of uh, attention, both in human uh, medicine and um, veterinary medicine. Uh, there is something of a complicated legal landscape, uh, um, uh, you know, around it. So it's important to make sure that we're talking about, you know, the same thing. So uh, most of the time when folks are talking about CBD oil products, those are products that come from industrial hemp sources. So um, those are low in THC, uh, which many people may uh, recognize as the, the psychoactive active component uh, of cannabis that's used recreationally. Um, THC may have medicinal properties, uh, but it can be dangerous in animals. So uh, most of the studies that are done are, are looking at kind of more pure um, CBD or cannabidiol products, uh, um, of which there are literally hundreds that are available. Um, and if you go to any gas station across the United <laughs> States, you will see many of them. Uh, um, and as you walk down the pet food aisle at pet stores and other places, you will also see many of them. Um, there is very little information about what to do with CBD. Uh, um, if you look at the broad scientific literature in general, there are many potential applications of CBD um, that take advantage of, of natural um, cannabinoid receptors that are present in our bodies that have important functions in a variety of different physiologic processes. Um, so there are lots of studies that show that there may be a role for the use of CBD in the treatment or prevention of cancer um, in inflammatory conditions, um, uh, potentially in neurologic disorders or seizure disorders. And that work is just starting to be done in veterinary medicine. The problem is, as I alluded to before, you know, we have all these products already that are available, but they haven't really been studied in a robust fashion yet. Um, so the true answers to questions, we don't yet have them. Uh, we worked with one product here at Purdue um, and did kind of a traditional dose escalation study, which is how we typically find a dose for a, a drug intended to be used against cancer. Um, so the traditional thought about chemotherapy treatment is that if some is good, more must be better. Um, so we try to give as much as we can before the animal becomes sick. Um, so with the product we used, we were able to establish, you know, kind of a, a level that was safe to achieve without causing side effects. Um, and we did eventually see side effects, which is something that people will say CBD doesn't have, but it can. Um, so for us, those side effects were GI upset. Um, so um, largely diarrhea um, that seemed to be dose related. So the higher dose that we gave, the more diarrhea and the more severe diarrhea the dogs had, um, as well as changes in liver enzymes, um, which is something that's also been documented um, in other studies. Um, we took things one step further and collected samples from the livers to see if there was actual permanent liver injury. Um, and we weren't really able to document that. Um, and once we withdrew the CBD product, the liver enzymes normalized. 
Um, so from my perspective, that helps from a couple of things. It helps me to know that if a dog comes in that's getting treated with one of our traditional chemotherapy uh, medications or another traditional therapy and has elevated liver enzymes and is having diarrhea, but it's also being treated with CBD, we've got to rule out whether the CBD could be playing a role uh, you know, in that. Um, and two, it, it establishes you know, kind of a threshold to look at when there are actual clinical studies published. You know, If they're treating with a very, very low dose of CBD and we could go higher, you know, that leads some room for interpretation in those studies. Um, there's been at least one study published so far out of a group in Canada that does show some in vitro, so in cell culture, um, where they had um, cancer cells, bladder cancer cell lines, actually, that Debbie provided with them. Um, there was potentially some activity. Um, and so long term, I'd really like to see some, you know, again, rigorously designed studies uh, um, that are looking at treatment with CBD alone or treatment in combination with traditional chemotherapy drugs. Uh, um, and that may make those drugs you know, more efficacious, um, which is the story we've seen with other classes of drugs like the NSAIDs that Debbie already mentioned. So um, I think there's a lot to learn about CBD, uh, um, but the regulatory uh, um, nature of that is creating a, a lot of a lot of issues. Uh, um, and then kind of the, the Wild West mentality of, you know, I can already get it into a product and sell it to somebody is um, hindering that a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something that, that we would be interested in, in looking at over time in a, a controlled way in true clinical patients, because I really do believe there's value there. So, um, you know, one thing I like to joke around about with our, our residents and then sometimes talk to clients about is, um, you know, natural cures um, for cancer. Um, most of the drugs we already use for cancer that are the most efficacious actually come originally from natural sources. So some of our major chemotherapy drugs were, you know, isolated from soil microbes um, or already from other plants. And so there's no reason to not expect uh, um, that there may be beneficial compounds like CBD that have already been discovered that are out there that just need to be studied more to bring them into that, you know, mainstream therapeutic window. Very interesting. Thank you for that information. Um, another question was similar was about various supplements and their role in cancer, cancer prevention and therapy. And I know we've kind of touched on that a little bit, but would one of you want to dive into the potential of supplements and how that could impact treatment? I think I'd nominate Mike, because he actually gave a talk at a national meeting on this I'm, not too long ago. Yeah, I, so I can Mike, talk on this. Yes, of course. Um, so um, the, the term supplements can mean any of a number of things. Um, I, you know, supplements can be things like vitamins, things like uh, so-called nutraceuticals, nutritional products. They can be um, herbal products derived from uh, Eastern medicine, you know, that type of background. The, the, the term supplement can, can encompass a, a variety of things. So I'll understand that when, when I use the term supplement, I'm using it broadly. Um, to understand the role that supplements could play in the treatment of cancer and prevention of cancer, I think it's important to first understand how um, traditional medications for cancer are studied and um, developed and eventually approved for use in, in both human and veterinary cancer patients. Um, the first evidence that a, a product, you know, a, a drug or some sort of chemical compound may work against cancer usually comes from what are called in vitro studies. That means basically studying how the, uh, how cancer cells respond to those, uh, those substances in a test tube. So you apply the substance to the cancer cells, you watch and see if they die or some other, some other behavior of the cancer cells changes and you identify the concentrations of the substance um, at which that sort of change occurs. The next step uh, in the investigation of, of a, a compound as a potential anti-cancer agent comes in um, animal trials. So animals traditionally um, used in cancer research have been mice um, in which tumors have been implanted or somehow otherwise induced. Um, as many of you know, some of those studies are now being conducted in pet dogs with cancer because they can answer different questions than you can in a mouse. But ultimately, an animal study is, is sort of an intermediary between the test tube study and, um, and ultimately studying the, the, the compound in, in human clinical trials. And the animal study will answer things like, is it safe to give this compound? Um, you know, is the animal going to experience serious side effects or is it going to die as a result of being administered this compound? Um, and can we get a tumor to shrink or to not grow or exhibit some sort of behavior um, that would suggest it, that it um, um, suggests that the compound has meaningful anti-cancer properties in this animal before we give it to a person? And if those animal trials are successful, 
then the next step is to test that, that compound in a person. Um, and the first level of trialing they do is what's called phase one trials. That's where they define the safety of the compound, so what sort of side effects it might have, as well as something that's really important, which is called the pharmacokinetics of the compound. Pharmacokinetics is I'm not going to try to bore anybody too much here, and I'm going to try to summarize it really quickly, but pharmacokinetics is the study of how drugs get around through the body and get out of the body. Um, and so in a pharmacokinetic study, say of an orally administered cancer drug, test subjects, human, human trial subjects would take the medication by mouth, they would swallow the pill, um, and then that medicine would eventually be absorbed out of their stomach and intestines into their bloodstream and distributed all over their body, and then eventually eliminated from the body in things like the urine and the stool. And the pharmacokinetic studies measure how much of that drug gets into the bloodstream um, and how does the, the, the body eliminate it. That's extremely important because those studies can be correlated with the original in vitro studies, the test tube studies. The test tube studies gave us a concentration of that drug that's likely to have anti-cancer effects. We can look at the concentration of that, blood, of, of that, that drug that is achievable in a human patient or an animal patient and see if they match up very well. If they do, if it's possible to achieve um, a, a blood level of that drug in a human patient that kills cancer cells in a test tube, that's a good thing. Um, and so if, if you get that plus a drug that doesn't cause serious side effects, then you move on to the next trials in people, which are efficacy trials in which they define, you know, does this drug actually um, uh, shrink cancers in a human cancer patient um, and does it extend survival? And eventually they compare that to um, a, a more traditional therapy, what's called a phase three trial. If you look at all the time and money it takes to take a drug from a test tube study to a drug that the Food and Drug Administration approves um, for use in a human cancer patient, that takes about 10 years and it costs about $100 billion. And um, a huge proportion of those drug investigations eventually fail. That's one reason drugs are so expensive. It's only one reason. There's other reasons that I won't get into. Um, but that's one reason that cancer drugs are so expensive and why it's so difficult to identify effective anti-cancer drugs. Now, let's take all of that information and go back to supplements. For most supplements on the market, none of this work has been done. Um, you know, we don't even have the in vitro studies. So the studies that tell us, um, does this drug kill cancer cells at a certain concentration in a Petri dish? For a, a number of them, we don't even have safety studies either. Um, is this supplement safe to give to a pet at a certain dose? Is it going to cause side effects? Um, are those side effects going to be serious? We don't have that information either. I can give an example of a supplement for which some of this information exists and I think should temper our enthusiasm for using supplements, not for studying them, but for using them um, prematurely. Um, and that's an example of a supplement called Yunnan Bio, which some of you may have heard of. It's, it's a Chinese herbal supplement that is occasionally used. Well, actually it's frequently used in the treatment of a, a, a cancer called hemangiosarcoma in dogs. Um, pharmacokinetic and in vitro studies have been performed with this compound. What has been found in those studies is the concentration um, needed to kill hemangiosarcoma cells in a test tube is 100 times greater than what can be achieved when giving Yunnan bio to a dog by mouth. Um, so when you, you give Yunnan bio to a dog by mouth and you measure how much of the drug is actually in their bloodstream, it's 100 times less than what is needed to actually kill cancer cells in the test tube. Um, and so that's sort of a sobering example of how much we still have to learn about using these, using these, um, these therapies effectively. For a number of them, I, I think what we will probably find is that there is no dose at which they're likely to have meaningful anti-cancer effects. Um, meaningful meaning shrink a tumor or extend survival doesn't mean that they necessarily don't have beneficial effects, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that some of these therapies couldn't be used in the prevention of cancer rather than the treatment of cancer. That's a whole different ballgame. But for most of these products, the information needed to let us use them in an informed fashion such that we can identify a meaningful benefit to cancer patients just, just doesn't exist. Um, and in some cases, they, they can be harmful. The classic example there is St. John's wort, which isn't used commonly in treating cancer patients. But when St. John's wort is given um, to human cancer patients, being treated with chemotherapy can make the side effects of the chemotherapy much, much worse. And it beca it's because it inhibits the, the ability of the body to get rid of those drugs. 
Um, so we, we just have to be really, really careful about using su supplements um, in, in pets with cancer. We have to learn a lot more about how to use them best. So Micah, I, very interesting information. Yeah. Your, your, your reply jogged two memories that I have, and one of them isn't necessarily supplements, but it was an, it was an aha moment I had. So I was a, uh, uh, a budding, I don't remember if I was a first year or second year resident, and I was so naive about so many things. Um, one example was we had a dog, it was actually my dog and had been treated with a, a, an unusual treatment approach and had complete regression of its cancer. And, and at the time, I didn't realize how important that was. I thought, oh, we, we, surely we do this stuff every day. You know, this is, this, is, this is not that unusual. And I learned it wasn't. But along about that time, I was talking to one of my mentors and we were talking about survival in dogs with bladder cancer. And, and, and I was saying, you know, his name was Tom Chan. I said, you know, Tom, I, this data doesn't look right to me. I said, I don't understand this because the dogs that got my treatment, their median survival was shorter than the dogs that didn't get any treatment. I said, that can't be right. I did something wrong. You know, I blew the study. How could this be? Because it was, it was a, a, a fairly well-known cancer drug. And he says, oh, well, he said, he said, that's entirely possible that your treatment makes things worse. And that was sort of an aha moment because I just thought that couldn't possibly be. But anyway, the other thing that came to mind as you were speaking and, and something else I really, really want us to figure out is with all of the, I'm gonna call them micronutrients that we use, um, all those studies to date, we've learned they have what I call a sweet spot. And, that's a, and that is, and, and uh, the example you all have heard me use is some work Dave Waters did several years ago with vitamin E selenium. And that is when dogs and people have the optimal amount of vitamin E and selenium in their bodies, they have less cancer. And I, I'm, I'm really overgeneralizing this. His study was in prostate cancer and, and, and tagged on some work in men and some work in dogs. But what he learned was that there's a sweet spot. And if you have this nice concentration, cancer risk is lower. DNA damage is lower in dogs. And if you have too little, then cancer risk goes up. But the thing about his study that really struck me was if you go higher, cancer risk goes up. So the situation we're in is most dogs that eat a balanced diet have the right amount of vitamin E selenium. And if we supplement it, we're gonna send them into the higher range and then increase their cancer risk. So I agree with what you know Chris has said and Mike has said, these things have a lot of, they have a lot of potential, there's stuff there. You know, I, I also tell people when they want natural drugs for cancer, I point out that the vincristine and vinblastine I use came originally from the periwinkle plant. And, you know, adriamycin comes from soil fungus. So there's definitely stuff to learn. You know, we just need to, we need to, we need more time and more resources to, to figure it out. So anyway, that's my take on, on, on that question. Sorry, Rebecca, we, we got really, we really got into that one. That's good, no, that's great. I, I think- just want to comment. I, yeah. I saw a comment on the chat about how to spell that one Chinese herb. It, it's Yunnan Bio. First word is Yunnan, Y-U-N-N-A-N. -N. Second word has, actually has a variety of spellings. The most commonly used one is B-A-I, Y-A-O. And I'm sorry, I haven't been watching the chat. So nope. if there's stuff up there I need to know about, let me know. <laughs> I think we have time for just maybe one more um, brief question. And so um, with that, can you talk just a little bit about immunotherapy for TCC um, and, and what that looks like? Um, yes, and, and I might be able to, yes, I can, yes, I can do that. So <laughs> there, there, are two, there are two aspects to this. There's what we can do today and there's what we can do in the coming years. So what we can do today is what we've learned is that some of the drugs we use that are already part of the standard of care actually have immune enhancing activity. And the one that Dr. Darwin has, has studied the most is, or the class we've studied the most is what's called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So this is paroxicam, Deramax, meloxicam, of drugs in that class. 
And so I mentioned earlier that some of our, our best drugs actually work through the immune system, and there's really compelling evidence that that's the case for these. So when we give those drugs, we are having a beneficial effect on the immune system. I think that's going to hold true for other traditional drugs, and we have some studies ongoing. So, you know, in the not too distant future, I can tell you about those. But what what I see us doing in the future is introducing the class of drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And some of you have probably heard of these. One's called Keytruda. Uh, there's one called atezolizumab, nivolumab. Um, on TV, it's the nice lady with lung cancer sitting on the stool you know, the, the high stool talking to the interviewer saying how grateful she is she received this rather than chemotherapy. So those are coming. Um, our group is developing one. Um, I'm hoping we'll be in pets by summer 2024, but it, it may take longer because production of these things is not trivial. Um, Merck has announced they have one. I expect theirs will be out in the not too distant future. So those are going to add to our arsenal um, and I think I better stop there because I think we're about out of time. But as I said, I'm excited about immunotherapy. I, I really, you know, think it's going to, to really change what we do. Perfect. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I hope you guys all are ex as excited about the future as you heard today um, and really were able to take away some valuable information. If your question wasn't able to get answered today, um, we do plan to host additional in the future sessions regarding more specific topics and educational pieces with the different doctors. So we hope you'll join us in the future and that you have a great day. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank we you. Sure appreciate your interest. Yeah. Thank you.